Southern Fried True Crime covers cases that may not be suitable for young listeners, and there may also be some explicit language used. Listener discretion is advised. I'd like to emphasize that today's episode is especially graphic and grisly. Sensitive listeners, please take heed, and this episode is definitely not for children. The number of women on death row in the United States is around 55. It fluctuates daily with new convictions, appeals, commutations, etc. The women on death row can be divided into four main categories. Those that kill strangers, acquaintances, husbands, and children. Depressingly, there are more women on death row convicted of killing their own children than for any other type of murder. Krista Gale Pike was 18 when she tortured and murdered Colleen Slammer and was sentenced to death just two weeks after her 20th birthday. She represents an unusual demographic. Less than 4% of women given a death sentence murder while under the age of 20. Her victim is even more unusual. Most women kill for money, and usually they kill a husband, boyfriend, or stranger to accomplish this. Even the women that kill their own children are often financially motivated. But Krista killed for the second oldest reason, love, or more accurately, jealousy. And almost from the moment she was arrested, she's done nothing but reveal just how vicious and remorseless she really is. Welcome to Episode 16, The Depravity of Krista Pike. The old newsroom saying, if it bleeds, it leads, still holds true. But the narrative of the story usually is centered on the victim. Holly Bobo comes to mind. When a beautiful white woman is murdered, her name will be used in the media more than her killers. But Colleen Slimmer's murder was different. She was definitely an attractive young blonde woman, too, and yet the focus has always been on her killer, Krista Pike. I said in the opening that Krista is an unusual killer, not just because of her age or who she killed, but because of her depravity. That is the reason Krista is so notorious, why we are so fascinated. When any young, attractive white woman kills, her face and name will dominate the headlines. But when she is revealed to be a true monster, the public becomes obsessed. The day after Krista Pike was sentenced to death for the murder of Colleen Slammer, she wrote a letter to her boyfriend and accomplice to Daryl Shipp. She said, quote, You see what I get for trying to be nice to the hoe? I went ahead and bashed her brains out so she'd die quickly instead of letting her bleed to death and suffer more, and they fucking fry me. Ain't that some shit? If this is the first time you're hearing of Krista Pike, I bet you won't forget her now. But let's first talk about her victim, an innocent, sweet girl, determined to get an education despite a learning disability. Colleen Ann Slimmer was born September 20, 1975, in Pennsylvania. Her parents soon divorced, and her mother, May, moved to Florida and remarried a man named Raul Martinez. Colleen would be close to her stepfather, but still see her biological father, Mike, on holidays. Colleen had a reading disability and dropped out of school in the ninth grade, frustrated with her grades and life. She was working fast food jobs and considering going back to school when she learned that she could get her GED in the Job Corps. She decided to join the Knoxville Job Corps because she wanted technical training in computers, training that was not offered at the Job Corps near her hometown. May Martinez dreaded her daughter leaving but she knew she was a good girl who could excel given the chance. Colleen arrived in Knoxville, Tennessee in early September of 1994. Just three weeks later, Colleen would call her mother very upset. She was disappointed with the depressing facilities, the graffiti littered walls, and there was little supervision. She told her mother that the kids there ran wild. Her room had already been rifled through and some of her things stolen. She didn't want this life. 
She was serious about her education. Her mother was sympathetic, but reminded her that she had signed a contract for six months. If she could last six months, she could come back home and then decide what she wanted to do. Colleen also told her mother that there were three students there who were stalking and bullying her. She said one in particular had shown up in her room in the middle of the night, standing over her bed, flashing a knife at her before she left. This girl was convinced that Colleen wanted her boyfriend. Colleen cried to her mother that she did not want him and she didn't even really know him, but she never mentioned their names to her mother. May Martinez told her daughter she should go and see the Job Corps counselor and let them know what was going on. She did, but her counselor was unsympathetic and brushed her off, telling her he would look into it. There is no evidence that he ever followed through with this. May was worried for her daughter, but not to the point where she thought Colleen should quit and come home. We have to remember the context of when this happened. In 1994, stalking was just beginning to really be understood. The murder of actress Rebecca Schaefer brought about the first American anti-stalking laws in California in 1990, just four years earlier. And it would be five more years before the Columbine tragedy and bullying in schools would jump to the forefront of our culture. And Colleen quit complaining and stuck with the program, despite the harassment she was going through. She called her mother after the Christmas break, which she had spent in Pennsylvania with her father, sounding excited and happy again, and definitely jubilant at the thought of returning home in a month. This was January 7th, five days before her murder. She actually called her mother again on the day of her death. But she got off the phone quickly because she was headed out to rent a movie at Blockbuster Video with a friend. Maybe Colleen felt lighter and sounded happier when she called her mom because the friend she was going to rent a movie with was Krista Pike. She had never named her main tormentor to her mother, and she didn't mention a name now but maybe her happiness was relief. Krista later admitted that she told Colleen she wanted to make peace with her and be friends to get her to come with her that night. Krista Gale Pike was born March 10, 1976, in West Virginia to parents Glenn and Carissa. Glenn evidently ditched the situation pretty quickly and left Carissa on her own with their daughter. Carissa was a registered nurse, and for a while, she worked two jobs and tried to raise Krista by herself. But Carissa liked to party, and she often left her daughter with her own mother, Zola Fotos, an abusive alcoholic who supposedly beat Krista and locked her in a closet for punishment. At two years old, Carissa would give up custody of her daughter to Krista's paternal grandmother, Delpha Pike, and move to North Carolina with her boyfriend. According to her family and later psychiatrists at her trial, Krista never formed the proper attachment to her mother, but she did adore her paternal grandmother and was despondent at her death in 1988. After her grandmother's death, Krista was shuttled between her parents during her teen years when she really started acting out. Both had already remarried and had other children and didn't seem to have time to deal with Krista. She began drinking and smoking pot by age 11, boasting to some that she had started as early as eight years old. Her own mother admitted that during Krista's teen years, she drank and smoked pot with a girl in some attempt at bonding, although I think you could argue that she just liked getting wasted herself. Glenn Pike characterized his daughter as disobedient, dishonest, and manipulative. He threw Krista out several times, but made her leave for good when he suspected that she was sexually abusing his two-year-old daughter from his second marriage. Krista's mom pretty much let the girl run wild. At 14, Krista was allowed to let her boyfriend move in, until they got into such a physical fight that Krista pulled a knife and the cops were called. But no charges were filed. She wasn't in school. She couldn't keep a job. Her father was done with her, and her mother was at her wit's end. Carissa finally got Krista enrolled in Job Corps. 
she could get her GED and hopefully some vocational training so she'd be able to get a job. Christo actually was interested in the training to become a nurse's assistant. She left Durham, North Carolina and headed for Knoxville, Tennessee. I've read in a few places that Job Corps is where troubled youth are often sent, though that wasn't really the idea when it was formed during President Lyndon Johnson's administration. It was more aimed at giving a free vocational education to underprivileged kids. If you read the criteria for entering the program, Krista doesn't sound like she would make it other than the fact that she could claim low income. Drug and alcohol abuse and behavioral problems would make her ineligible. To this day, their website claims that students will, quote, build friendships and benefit from a supportive network of peers while living in a safe, drug and violence free environment. I guess Krista cleaned up long enough to pass a drug test. And though she was a dropout and had many problems at home, she didn't have a juvenile record. Or maybe the attitude towards Job Corps was earned, and it really was a last stop for troubled teens. It was certainly considered a blight around the UT campus and Knoxville in general, and it did close down three months after Colleen's murder, buckling to public pressure. Krista Pike had been at Job Corps about a week when she met a young African-American teenager from Memphis named Tadaryl Ship. Tadaryl was a self-proclaimed Satanist, and Krista not only pledged herself to Tadaryl, but embraced the supposed devil worship herself. When I first started researching this case, I did sort of roll my eyes at the Satanism references, regardless of what you'll hear later about the murder. This happened during the height of the Satanic Panic. Contemporary articles definitely reflect the hysteria of the time. But I did find reference in court transcripts that Tadaryl did practice in Satanism. At least, that's what he wanted others to believe. Whatever else you choose to believe about the motivations of this pair, I still have doubts that either of them were true Satanists, in that Satanism is an actual religion. Neither of them strike me as devout to anything but their own selfish needs. I think that Satanism was a way for Tadaryl to seem even more cool or tough to his friends. And Krista, obsessed with her boyfriend, was along for the ride. She even had a small cartoon devil tattooed on her chest with the words Little Devil written underneath. For some reason, Krista had become jealous of Colleen Slimmer to the point of obsession soon after Colleen arrived in Knoxville. It was hard for anyone to understand why. But as attractive as Krista Pike was, she was also short, a bit chubby, and had dark, poofy, naturally curly hair. Physically, she was the opposite of the taller, slender, and blonde Colleen Slemmer. Sometimes it can be that simple for teenage girls, especially those that are already unstable or have low self-esteem. Friends of Colleen's later insisted that she had no interest in Tadaryl's ship, and Colleen had also denied it to her mother while explaining the situation. But Krista's one-sided obsession grew into a vendetta. She seemed to truly believe that Colleen was trying to steal her man, and she started making threats and harassing her daily. I read in a couple of places that Tadaryl had put this notion in her head. This makes sense to me, though the point was not discussed in their trials. But why else would she fixate on Colleen? I think, aside from jealousy, this terrorizing of Colleen also added to Krista's burgeoning tough chick persona. On January 11th, 1995, Krista Pike was restless, bored. She told classmate Kim Iloilo that she was going to kill Colleen Slimmer because she, quote, just felt mean that day. The next day, January 12th, around 8 p.m., Kim saw Krista, Colleen, Tadaryl Ship, and one other Job Corps student named Shadola Peterson walking away from the Job Corps Center and towards 17th Street. Then at 10.15 p.m., she saw only three walk back. Krista, Tadaryl, and Shadola. Shadola Peterson was a quiet African-American student and was a friend of Tadaryl's as well as Krista. Growing up poor in Cleveland, Tennessee, Job Corps was also a step to improve her future. But she liked getting high and hanging out. 
and truth be told, she probably wouldn't mind watching a good fight, because there is no indication that she had to be cajoled into participating that cold January night. To Daryl would claim that Shadola had the box cutter that Krista wanted to use, though he and Krista both later claimed that she only wanted to scare Colleen with it. Shadola denies that the box cutter belonged to her. I think they brought Shadola along to put Colleen more at ease. Why else would Colleen agree to go anywhere with the girl who had been harassing her and the boy that supposedly caused the whole thing? Krista had also gotten her hands on a miniature meat cleaver, though she never told who she got it from. So on that cold, rainy day, Krista approached Colleen and asked her if she wanted to go rent a movie from Blockbuster and stop and smoke weed somewhere. Colleen was of course suspicious, but hopeful that maybe Krista finally understood that she wasn't a threat and agreed to go along. When they walked outside, she was surprised to see Tadaryl and Shadola were there. Krista told her that they all wanted to make peace with her and smoke some pot together. All four signed out of the dormitory and headed towards the woods where Krista said they wouldn't be caught smoking. Once they arrived at the secluded spot, Colleen got nervous and asked Krista if they were really planning on smoking weed. Krista turned on her in a flash, screaming and yelling and punching. It was a frenzied attack. She grabbed Colleen's head and slammed it down on her own knee. Colleen fell to the ground, though she was fighting back. Krista slammed Colleen's head against the concrete, while the poor girl repeatedly asked, Why are you doing this to me? According to Shadola, Colleen seemed to find some renewed strength and started yelling, Fuck you, and you can't do this to me. She then said, You're going to get cut from the program anyway after this, you bitch. At this, Krista kicked her in the face, screaming, Shut up! She kept kicking her in the side and all over her body as Colleen cried, rolling into a ball. At one point, she broke away and started running, but then Tadaryl stepped in and knocked her back to the ground. Krista then ordered Colleen to take off her coat, shirt, and bra, thinking that this would keep her from trying to run again. And then Krista pulled out the box cutter. For the next 30 to 40 minutes, she beat, kicked, and slashed at Colleen Slimmer as she lay screaming on the ground. At some point, Krista thought she heard something and stopped the assault and went looking around the bushes to see if anyone could see or hear them. I think it is important to note here that Krista could have stopped. She was in control enough to stop and check for witnesses. She could have stopped the attack before Colleen died, but she didn't. She then returned and pulled out the meat cleaver. Somehow, Colleen managed to get up and run again, half naked and bleeding. And again, Tadaryl stopped her, and this time slammed her head into the ground. Krista kept slashing at Colleen all over her body and used the cleaver on her back. Shadola finally spoke up, yelling, She's going to tell on you. You're going to go to prison. Krista later said this is when she knew she had to kill her. She started slashing at Colleen's throat and screaming, The bitch won't die. She handed the box cutter to Tadaryl, who came over and carved a pentagram into Colleen's chest. We know that Colleen was still alive during this mutilation because the coroner would later testify that the red swelling around the carving indicated that her heart was still beating. Finally, Krista picked up a big piece of asphalt and started beating Colleen in the head. According to Shadola and to Daryl, at this point, Tadaro yelled at Krista to stop, saying, That's enough. But Krista coolly replied, No, I want to see her brains flow. She lifted the chunk of asphalt high over her head and smashed it down onto Colleen's head, cracking her skull until brain matter did start flowing out of her head. She then began dancing around the body and singing. This was from her own account, by the way not just from Shadola and to Daryl. She then bent down and picked up a piece of Colleen's skull and put it in her jacket pocket. At this point, we're going to take another short break for a word from our sponsors.
Later that night, Krista went back to Kim's room and bragged that she had killed Colleen and said she had brought back a piece of her skull as a souvenir, which she proudly showed to Kim. She said Colleen had begged her to stop cutting and beating her, but she didn't stop because Colleen would not quit screaming and crying. She also told Kim about the meat cleaver and the pentagram that was carved into Colleen's chest. She claimed that they also carved one into her forehead, but with the mutilation and damage to Colleen's face and head, that was never proven. I'm not sure why that even matters. What she had done was horrific enough. I guess the point is, she was even embellishing as she bragged to Kim, and she was also dancing around and doing her sing-song thing again. When Kim saw Krista at breakfast the next morning, she asked her what she had done with the piece of skull. Krista told her that it was in her pocket and then said, And yes, I'm eating breakfast with it. During a class later that morning, Krista also told another classmate, Stephanie Wilson. Krista pointed to brown spots on her shoes and said, That ain't mud on my shoes, that's blood. She then pulled a napkin from her pocket and showed Stephanie a piece of bone, which she said was part of Colleen's skull. Just like with Kim, Krista told Stephanie all of the gory details, her story not varying much. She again gleefully recalled how Colleen's blood had poured out and that she had seen her brains. Neither Kim Iloilo nor Stephanie Wilson reported Krista's statements to the police, and the day after her murder, on January 13th at around 8 a.m., an employee at the University of Tennessee Grounds Department discovered Colleen's body near the greenhouses on the agricultural part of campus. Officers from the Knoxville Police Department and the UT Police Department quickly arrived at the scene. Colleen's body was lying face down on a pile of debris. She was nude from the waist up. She was covered in blood and dirt. Her head had been bludgeoned. Multiple cuts and slashes were all over her torso. Her face was so mutilated it would not be recognizable. She was later officially identified through dental records. As other officers arrived, they began securing the crime scene. The bushes were trampled. There were hand and knee prints in the mud and drag marks. A large pool of blood was found about 30 feet from Colleen's body. The full crime scene would eventually be 100 feet long by 60 feet wide or about 30 by 18 meters. Homicide detective Randy York with the Knoxville Police Department noticed a group of girls standing over to the side watching, and one particular girl was giggling. That was Krista Pike. By now, word of the discovery of Colleen's body had gotten out, and both Kim Iloilo and Stephanie Wilson now called the authorities and told them what Krista Pike had been bragging about. Krista, Tadaryl, and Shadola were picked up within 36 hours of the murder and taken in for questioning. One of Krista's teachers found her jacket left in a classroom and turned it in to the police after seeing the news. The piece of Colleen's skull was still in the pocket. Krista waived her Miranda rights and signed a waiver before questioning. She explained in graphic detail exactly how she tortured and killed Colleen Slemmer. Her statement was tape-recorded and transcribed into 46 pages. At trial, copies of the transcription were given to the jury, and the jurors were allowed to listen to the tape through individual headphones. In her statement, Krista claimed that she and Colleen had been having problems for a while. She even claimed that she was the one who woke up one night to find Colleen standing over her with a knife. She claimed that Colleen had been trying to get her boyfriend and had been, quote, running her mouth everywhere. Krista also claimed that Colleen had deliberately provoked her because she knew Krista would be terminated from the Job Corps program the next time she became involved in a fight. Krista insisted that she had not planned to kill Colleen Slimmer, but instead planned to only fight Colleen and to let her know, quote, to leave me the hell alone. However, she did admit that she had taken the box cutter and the meat cleaver with her when they had all left the Job Corps Center that day. She said she had borrowed the miniature meat cleaver, but refused to identify the person who had loaned it to her. She coldly recounted how Colleen had repeatedly tried to get up and run. She said Colleen had pitifully bargained for her life, 
begging Krista to just talk to her and promising her that if she would just let her go, she would walk all the way back home to Florida. Colleen swore she wouldn't tell. Krista told her to shut up because, quote, it was harder to hurt somebody when they're talking to you. She said the more Colleen talked, the more she kicked her in the face. Eventually, Krista said she could hear Colleen breathing blood in and out and could see her jerking around on the ground. She even got up and mimicked this to the stunned officers in the room. She said the last thing she said to Colleen was, quote, Colleen, do you know who's doing this to you? She told the detectives that Colleen had finally died after she cracked her skull open. Then she and Tadaryl each grabbed one of Colleen's feet and dragged her to an area near some trees, leaving her body on a pile of dirt and debris. She denied carving the pentagram into Colleen's chest, but said that Tadaryl was the one who did it. He himself would casually admit to all of this as well. Where Krista seemed to be enjoying the recounting of the torture, Tadaryl was calm and matter-of-fact in his confession. He did admit to worshipping the devil, but denied that Colleen's murder was a human sacrifice and that carving the pentagram into her chest was just something that popped into his head. At trial, after Krista's statement was played for the jury, the prosecutor introduced pictures of Krista and Tadaryl taken at the Knoxville Police Department on the day the statement was given, January 14, 1995. In the pictures, both of them were wearing pentagram necklaces. I am going to point out again that I think the Satanism angle of this is bullshit. These were teenagers acting tough, trying on personas. I don't believe they truly practiced Satanism as a religion, nor do I believe that this was any sort of ritualistic occult killing. Krista Pike brutally beat, slashed, and bludgeoned another teenager to death. To Daryl was her accomplice, and probably an instigator. The pentagram was just an afterthought. Detective Randy York testified at Krista's trial that she took him to the exact location where Colleen's body was found. He said her affect veered between bored and impatient to gleeful. She was enjoying reliving the murder. To Daryl Shipp, on the other hand, was just cold. Shadola Peterson was scared and quiet. She was the only one of the three to make bond, and she quickly made a deal with the prosecution for her testimony against Krista and Tadaryl. It is debatable how much she did or did not participate, but there is no physical evidence tying her to the murder. Neither Krista nor Tadaryl had bothered to hide or dispose of their own clothing used during the murder, and Colleen Slammer's DNA was found on both. Dr. Sandra Elkins, the Knox County Medical Examiner, performed the autopsy on Colleen. Dr. Elkins described her body as covered with dirt and twigs. After removing the rest of her clothes and cleaning the body, Dr. Elkins had attempted to catalog the slash and stab wounds on Colleen's torso by assigning a letter of the alphabet. There were so many wounds that eventually Dr. Elkins decided to catalog only the most serious and major wounds. She explained that to catalog every one of them, she would have probably been in the morgue for three days. She had counted over 300 superficial wounds before she gave up. These were in addition to the mortal wounds that Colleen had suffered to her throat and the bludgeoning to her head. In addition, Dr. Elkins said Colleen had purple contusions on her knees, indicating fresh bruising consistent with crawling and defensive wounds on her right arm cause of death was the blunt force trauma to her head, but she would have died eventually from the slashes to her throat and internal injuries. Dr. Elkins had sent the skull to Dr. Murray Marks, an anthropologist at UT, so it could be reconstructed. She needed to reconstruct the skull in order to see how much force was applied as well as the weapon that was used. Pieces of asphalt were found embedded in the skull. During the trial, the state put Colleen Slimmer's actual skull into evidence, not just the one piece that Krista Pike had kept, the whole skull. Dr. Murray Marks used the skull in demonstration for trial testimony. The skull had been thoroughly cleansed, but honestly, I cannot believe they used it at the trial. 
They could have made a model of the skull after reconstructing it. They simply could have used autopsy photos to show the damage and introduce the pieces of asphalt. The only probative value of having the skull in court was to show that the piece Krista had taken fit perfectly, like a piece to a puzzle. And, of course, this was a hotly debated argument on appeal. But the judge astonishingly ruled that it was no more prejudicial than a model would have been. I strongly disagree for so many reasons, but really, why did they need to do this? Aside from the crime scene and autopsy photos, they had two confessions and eyewitness testimony from Shadola Peterson. This was overkill. Ironically, maybe that was their point to show the overkill used in Colleen's torture and murder. And Krista's defense was based on diminished capacity. Dr. Eric Ingham, a clinical psychologist, testified for the defense and stated that he had conducted a clinical interview and had administered a battery of tests to Krista Pike. Krista's IQ was 111, which is in the 77th percentile, and which the psychologist characterized as remarkable since she'd only completed the ninth grade. However, he concluded that Krista suffered from a very severe borderline personality disorder. He testified that Krista was not so dysfunctional that she needed to be institutionalized, but instead that she had a multiplicity of problems in relationships, in controlling her behavior, and in achieving vocational and academic goals. During direct examination, Dr. Ingham admitted that the tests unequivocally showed that Krista had no symptoms of brain damage and that she was not insane. But he insisted that Krista had not acted with deliberation or premeditation in killing Colleen. These points are key in proving first-degree murder, securing the death penalty. Dr. Ingham instead insisted that Krista had acted in a manner consistent with his diagnosis of borderline personality disorder she had lost control. He explained that she had danced around when relating the murder to her friend Kim because of the emotional release she experienced, not because she was just a cold-blooded killer. When questioned about the piece of skull found in Krista's coat, Dr. Ingham explained that Krista actually had no identity of her own, and the action of taking and displaying a piece of Colleen's skull to her friends was her way of getting recognition and status. The social recognition from her peers would also reaffirm her relationship with Tadarell in her mind. Dr. William Burnett, a psychiatrist at Vanderbilt University, testified that he had reviewed the statements of Krista, Tadarell, and Shadola, and the reports of Dr. Ingham, Dr. Elkins, and Dr. Marks. Dr. Burnett described the phenomenon of collective aggression, where a group of people gather and become emotionally aroused together, resulting in violence. On cross-examination, Dr. Burnett admitted that he had not examined or questioned Krista, Tadarell, or Shadola, and he admitted that he did not have enough information to offer an expert opinion as to whether Krista acted with intent or premeditation in killing Colleen Slimmer. But I do find his testimony about collective aggression to be compelling. Would Krista have gone as far as she did without an audience? And Tadarell did participate, not only carving the pentagram, but by keeping Colleen from running away. And he admitted to also striking her in the head, though it was Krista who delivered the death blows. Shadola has never been characterized as participating in any part of the assault, though she definitely watched and stood guard. And she did warn Krista that she had gone too far and would now be caught and go to prison. Krista claims this is when she knew Colleen had to die, but I'm not really sure it mattered at that point. She knew what she was doing. All the psychiatrists who examined Krista Pike found her to be extremely bright. They also all judged her to be sane in legal terms. They found no symptoms of brain damage, which can correlate to violence, usually frontal lobe damage. Though in one of Krista's later appeals, her attorneys would try and argue frontal lobe damage. But they had no physical proof of this. It was just supposed damage that could have been caused by her mother's drinking while pregnant with Krista. However, all of the doctors agreed with the diagnosis of borderline personality disorder. People with borderline personality disorder are similar to psychopaths and can be just as dangerous. They have poor impulse control, 
a volatile affect, a fluctuating self-image that bounces between despair and self-aggrandizement, and they have trouble in their relationships. Psychiatrist Dr. Rhonda Friedman wrote, Individuals with borderline personality disorder tend to be hyper-aware of possible abandonment. They become easily suspicious and tend to inaccurately interpret the behavior or intentions of others. I think it's obvious that Krista Pike had abandonment issues. She was put off on her grandmother at the age of two. When her grandmother died, she was passed back and forth between her parents, who didn't really want to raise her, much less care about her mental health. They had many warning signs and plenty of time to get help for Krista, but they never did. The psychiatrist who examined Krista also found her to have many psychopathic tendencies. A person with strong psychopathic traits who also has borderline personality disorder can be an extremely volatile, manipulative, and dangerous person. And especially with women, their violent acts are usually situational rather than associated with power or control. They tend to be reacting to something like jealousy or rejection. There is no question that Krista was jealous to the point of fixation of Colleen Slimmer. There is also her complete and total lack of remorse for what she did, and it's not as if her time in prison has changed her. On August 24, 2001, Krista, with the help of fellow inmate Natasha Cornett, attempted to strangle another inmate named Patricia Jones with a shoestring and almost choked her to death. Against prison policy, Krista, Patricia, and Natasha were locked in a holding cell together while the guards dealt with a small fire on the same floor. I've read that many people believe that the guard who made this decision did it purposely, and while he was reprimanded, no charges came of it, and there was not enough evidence to charge Natasha Cornett as her accomplice. But Krista was convicted of attempted first-degree murder on August 12, 2004. A transcript of Krista's conversation with her mother on the phone shows that she laughed as she described how Patricia looked as she fell unconscious to the floor after being choked with the shoestring. She said, I wrapped that shoestring around her and tried to choke the life out of her. She was passed out on the ground, Mama, twitching and foaming at the mouth. Her eyeballs was bugged out so far her eyelids were flipped up. She said all this with glee, and then she said, I bet you if she gets near me, I'm going to do it again. I'm going to succeed this time. See, now I know the difference between premeditated murder and what happened with Colleen. Because, see, I premeditated the hell out of this. Krista also told a friend in a telephone conversation on August 29, 2004, that was taped and transcribed by prison officials, I definitely premeditated this. My blood pressure never even went up. I stayed calm the whole time. I don't think there is any doubt left of what Krista Pike really is. She has given interviews where she claims to be sorry and says she, quote, feels for Colleen's mother. But if you watch these interviews, her eyes shift around and her demeanor completely changes when she's making these statements. She is not good with a mask. This is what keeps her from being a true psychopath. Having said that, she is still legally sane. And in Tennessee, we still have the death penalty. It only took the jury three hours to deliberate and find Krista guilty. At sentencing, Judge Mary Beth Leibowitz imposed the harshest sentence possible. Just two weeks after her 20th birthday, Krista Pike became the youngest woman on death row. And she was scheduled to have a date with Old Sparky, the nickname of Tennessee's method of execution at the time, which was electrocution. In 1999, Tennessee courts ruled in favor of changing that method to lethal injection. Though death row inmates convicted before 1999 still have the option of Old Sparky if they want it. In June 2001, and then again in June 2002, against the advice of her lawyers, Krista asked the courts to drop her appeal and sought to have her execution scheduled. Judge Mary Beth Leibowitz granted this request and an execution date of August 19, 2002 was set. But Krista soon changed her mind again and went ahead with the appeals process. She was denied a new trial in 2008. The one thing Krista Pike has seemed to be scared of 
at least from what I can tell watching her interviews over the years as she grew older, was the electric chair. It's the reason she attacked Patricia Jones in prison, adding another 25 years to her sentence. Because Jones taunted her about being electrocuted, calling her chicken fried, even though obviously, by 2004, Krista had chosen the needle. If she is executed, she will be the first woman in Tennessee since 1837. But she is still fighting it. In March of 2016, a federal judge, Harry Matisse, rejected her appeal. In a 61-page opinion, he not only rejected the appeal, but he refused to grant permission for an appeal to the Sixth Circuit U.S. Court of Appeals. But Krista's current attorneys likely will ask the Federal Appeals Court and the U.S. Supreme Court for review anyway, even if the odds of success are slim. There have been 16 women executed since the death penalty was reinstated in the United States in 1976. Six of those were husband killers, two were family annihilators, and one killed her child. The rest were strangers or acquaintances. Like I said in the opening, Krista Pike does not fit in with any of the women already executed or those on death row. She is an anomaly. But maybe Randy York, the Knoxville detective, said it better when he described her as pure evil. It disgusted him how talkative and excited she was in her confession. He said he thought it was the highlight of her life. I am not going to get into the morality of the death penalty in the United States. You can make your own decision how you feel about it. But I will say, I think there were mitigating circumstances in Krista Pike's case. Her own mother testified and admitted that she was a horrible mother. Her family and friends also testified to her unstable and abusive childhood. She was diagnosed with borderline personality disorder. It is possible that we could learn more from Krista Pike if we studied her rather than putting her to death, especially because she's a woman. Colleen Slimmer's murder was so very senseless. It was not racially or sexually motivated, certainly not financial, and even the perceived motive of jealousy was completely false. I've never covered a case before where I believe the murderer killed for the sheer thrill of it, and I'm not sure that's exactly what happened here either. But I do believe that Krista initially attacked in an uncontrolled frenzy, and she did indeed enjoy it. But she had a moment to cool off and reflect when she stopped to make sure there were no witnesses. But by then, she had passed from assault into attempted murder, and she knew it. She willfully killed Colleen Slimmer, and I believe she does not truly regret it. One psychiatrist who examined Krista Pike said that she had the profile of a serial killer. She just got caught the first time she killed. Krista was quoted in an interview saying, I know I deserve to be here for the rest of my life. I understand that. I don't deserve to die for the actions of three individuals. Though she tried to cover for them at the time, she now claims to Daryl and Shadola equally participated. This is contrary to not only her own confession, but their statements and even the physical evidence. For their parts in the torture and murder of Colleen Slemmer, Tadaryl Ship received two consecutive life sentences, one for the murder and the other for conspiracy. Shadola Peterson received a six-year suspended sentence and was put on probation. Tadaryl escaped the death penalty because he was 17 at the time of Colleen's murder and therefore tried as a juvenile. He was given the harshest sentence under the law. Shadola's deal was a plea bargain for her testimony against Krista and Tadaryl. I am still conflicted about just how complicit Shadola Peterson really was. Did she really give the box cutter to Krista? Was she egging on the fight? I think she did both of those things, and I'm not sure she got the sentence she deserved. I think back to Colleen's phone call to her mother when she said that three students were harassing her. And regarding to Daryl's supposed Satanism, from the moment he went to jail awaiting trial, he did a complete 180 and suddenly found Jesus. He had a preacher write a letter to the judge on his behalf about his newfound faith, pleading for leniency while he was still awaiting sentencing. 
The judge was unmoved. She said that Tadaryl Ship was a dangerous man with no regard for human life. I think she's right. Krista may have led the assault on Colleen, but Tadaryl not only stopped Colleen from running, he assaulted her as well, and he admitted to being the one that carved the pentagram into her chest. I have no doubt he's sitting right where he should be. In 2012, an escape plot was uncovered at the Tennessee prison where Krista Pike is housed. She had a boyfriend on the outside conspiring with a guard. The guard was immediately fired and brought up on charges along with the boyfriend. In other recent news on the case, I discovered that the state of Tennessee has never released that piece of Colleen's skull back to her family. The piece that Krista saved as a souvenir and showed off to her friends. Her mother, May Martinez, has been fighting for over 23 years to fully lay her daughter to rest. The state's position is that they must keep it for evidence until all avenues of appeal have been exhausted. And we are almost there. I cannot imagine the heartbreak and anger Colleen's family went through and are still going through to this day. And as you may have guessed, they want Krista Pike put to death. They're tired of waiting. It's hard to blame them. I'll leave you with the words of Colleen's mother. May Martinez said, I don't feel the taxpayer's money should go to keep her alive. Why should she have the privilege to live? Southern Fried True Crime is written and produced by me, Erica Kelly. The original graphic art is by Coley Horner, and Southern Fried's original music is by Rob Harrison of Gamma Radio. Special thanks to Kathy Lynch for suggesting this episode. As always, if you enjoyed the show, tell a friend or rate and review on iTunes. I'm also on Stitcher and many other apps. If you're interested in supporting the show, come check out my Patreon page or my website, southernfriedtruecrime.com. I also have a merchandise store open at whatamaneuver.net. If you have any comments, corrections, or suggestions, you can email me at southernfriedtruecrime at gmail.com. I love hearing from you guys, and I'm always looking for new cases, so please feel free to reach out. I'm also all over social media. Just search the show name in your favorite platform if you'd like to connect with me there. If you're interested in discussing Krista Pike's case or any other episodes further, come check out my discussion group. It's linked to my main Facebook page. I would love to hear your thoughts. Until next time, thanks so much for listening. Y'all take care.